Hi, everybody, and welcome to One Green Things Interactive Workshop. We have a workshop today on Earth Day, past, present, and future. So we're excited to have you all here. Next slide, please. And then we'll go to the next slide. So first, before we get started, let's just talk about what we're going to cover. I want to do a quick introduction to One Green Thing, our approach to climate action, our mission. Make sure you're aware of the service superpower assessment. If you've already listened and tuned in to these workshops before, you can just fast forward until we get to the, the meat of the, of the conversation. And that is Earth Day, how it started, and what Earth Day means in 2023 and beyond. Next slide, please. So our approach at One Green Thing is that we start at the intersection of the climate crisis and mental health. Our mission is to tackle eco-anxiety through joyful daily action, leading to culture change for policy solutions. I think a challenge for a lot of people uh, is, is that when environmentalists like me say we need global policy and market solutions, what many people hear is individual action doesn't matter and I don't matter, and that's not true. You do matter because your individual action drives culture change, which is what we need for these big policy solutions to work. So our approach is that action, daily action, especially if it's joyful, aligned with what your strengths are, can abate anxiety. Connection can lessen loneliness and policy can help scale solutions. Next slide. So one of the things I realized as I was researching eco-anxiety, which is defined as the chronic fear of environmental doom, in fact, the Oxford English Dictionary just defined it in September 2021, even though it's been on the screen for the American Psychological Association for many years. But as I was reaching, uh, researching eco-anxiety, not only did I realize how troubled young people are about the future that they're inheriting from us, and in fact, there was a survey uh, in 2021 of 10,000 young people ages 16 through 25, and 47%, nearly half, said that climate anxiety or eco-anxiety interfered with their daily life, and one in four do not want to have children of their own because they're so worried about the climate crisis. As I was doing my research on the impacts of the mental health um, uh, the impacts of the climate crisis on mental health, I realized that I also needed to create a way for more people to see themselves in climate action. Because the reality is Gen Z, those are kids born from 1997 to 2017, young people today, feel very alone in climate action. And we need to have a multi-generational partnership and that's really critical. But what happens in the environmental community is that a lot of times people like me, and I'm a wonk, I'm a philanthropist wonk, depending on which day I take the assessment, but I'm a wonk. A lot of times we start the conversation in climate action with the what. Let's talk about the solution. Let's talk about microgrids. Let's talk about mushroom leather. Let's talk about this um, cool EV battery technology. And we forget to ask the most important question, which is the who. Individual behavior psychology or behavioral psychology studies on individual behavior change show that if someone can identify a new behavior with their identity, they're more likely to stick with that new behavior or new habit. So if I say I want to swim three times a week, I'm less likely to keep up with that behavior than if I say, hi, my name is Heather and I'm a swimmer. And so what I did is I realized that people needed a way to literally see themselves in climate action. So I've created an assessment. It's a little bit like Myers-Briggs or Enneagram or Strength Finders that helps you answer these questions. Who am I in service? How do I show up for the people I love? And there's seven different service superpower profiles. Again, if you've heard this before and you're watching on YouTube, just fast forward. But for our new audience, I think you'll find this really interesting. First, we have the adventurer. And the adventurer is the hands-on learner who embraces the physicality of the outdoors. The second is the beacon. The beacon speaks truth to power and is centered in fairness and justice. Then there's the influencer, which is all about people and the latest trends. And then there is the philanthropist, very big name for basically the giver, the person who shows up for the people they love by donating time and resources. Then we have the sage, which is focused on the spiritual connection to nature and can make that moral case for climate action. Then there's the spark. The spark is the cheerleader and the plus one. But please don't think that this person is not a leader. The cheerleader and the plus one is essential because without them, there is no movement. 
they're the folks who raise their hand. They're first to say, sure, I'm in when they're invited to go to a rally or invited to watch a documentary or, hey, come with me to this fundraiser. They're the ones who are always there for you and for their friends. And finally, there's the wonk. And the wonk is all about data and technology and the science, and they can take complex issues and translate them in a way that everybody can understand. Now, based on your particular service superpower, you then adopt a daily practice of sustainability, a one green thing. And this idea is that one green thing can bring more joy into your life. It's a little bit like meditation or prayer or yoga. It is a practice. And that practice is very important. Not only can it ease the anxiety you feel about the future because you're exercising a sense of agency and controlling what you can control, it also creates the essential culture shift that we need for these big climate solutions to take hold. Because without that culture shift, these, these solutions will not work. And you are a cultural change agent in your family, in your community, at your job, and with all of the people that you connect with every day. Next slide, please. So now let's talk a little bit about Earth Day. Earth Day was inspired by the environmental disasters of the 1960s. And the inaugural Earth Day was established by Wisconsin Senator Gaylord Nelson, and it was held on April 22nd, 1970. And I'm so lucky to have actually met Senator Nelson. I met him when he was 88 years young. I worked for the then Senator of Wisconsin, Russ Feingold, and we were celebrating back then, this was many years ago, the 40th anniversary of the Wilderness Act. And um, what Senator Nelson told me is that he learned to be an environmentalist by osmosis, by growing up in Clear Lake, Wisconsin. And the beauty of the woods in Wisconsin, the lakes in Wisconsin, really inspired in him a conservation ethic for his whole life. Next slide, please. But what happened specifically is that Nelson witnessed an oil spill in Santa Barbara in 1969, and he saw the hundreds of volunteers that helped show up with the cleanup. And on the flight back home from Santa Barbara, he read an article about the protests uh, um, in Vietnam. It was actually about Vietnam, the Vietnam War. And he was determined to, quote, get the nation to wake up and pay attention to the most important challenge the human species faces on the planet, and that was environmental degradation and environmental harm. So Nelson, who was senator in Wisconsin, as I said, encouraged his staff to reach out to college campuses and model the teachings of the anti-war movement to try to spark what he called a unity of purpose in the environmental movement. And I think this idea of a teaching is really important, not only a lesson learned from civil action uh, against the Vietnam War, but also the importance of education and connecting and electrifying young people when it's time for big social movements. He recruited a, a man named Dennis Hayes, who is now president of the Bullock Foundation in Seattle, but he recruited activist Dennis Hayes to help make this concept a reality. And in 1970, 20 million Americans, so 10% of the US population and 2000 college campuses participated in the first Earth Day. And now more than 200 million people around the world observe Earth Day. And actually the Earth Day Network says it's more around 1 billion if you consider the online and digital reach that we now have with the technology available to us. Next slide, please. So these are just a couple of photos I want to share with you. The one in the center is actually Earth Day 1970 in Philadelphia. Uh, and then to the right, we have a picture of Dennis Hayes with a phone. And then to the left, this was an ad that Poco um, put out that we have met the enemy and he is us. Um, there was huge, huge social campaigns, actually a Fifth Avenue marketing executive who was responsible for um, the buzz around the VW Beetle. He was the person who actually coined the term Earth Day, and there was all kinds of artists and advertising uh, folks who were involved in trying to organize this first Earth Day in 1970. Next slide, please. I think what's so interesting is that these activists that you see pictured here, and if you go online, you'll see all kinds of other photos just around the country and, and, and around the world with Earth Day, but especially this first Earth Day they were all in their 20s, right? And they're now baby boomers. So as we think about this multi-generational partnership, I think it's important for 
uh, older generations to share the progress that they've seen with the young activists and the young people that we know and love that are feeling so much anxiety about the climate. So Earth Day and this action of 10% of the American people participating had transformational long-term impacts. Because of this, and of course, there are also a lot of environmental challenges that were coming to light, but this movement helped create the National Environmental Education Act, the Occupational Safety and Health Act, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, and many, many more fundamental environmental laws. Next slide. So the takeaway from Earth Day 1970 is that elections matter, your voice matter, your voice matters, um, citizen action matters, and we have seen huge progress, and we've seen it, okay, I wasn't, I actually was not alive in 1970, <laughs> but people I know and love have seen tremendous progress when it comes to the environment, despite the amazing challenges that we're facing today, and we need to make sure we have those intentional conversations with young people, and so they understand that they are not alone when they're talking and, and thinking through what their future is going to be like. So Earth Day 2023, 192 countries, this is according to earthday.org, which is a great resource, celebrate Earth Day. More than 1 billion people are involved in Earth Day activities. Again, this reflects the digital programming that Earth Day and all these other associated partners, the Earth Day Network and associated partners are able to reach through social media and digital platforms. The Earth Day Network says that actually Earth Day is the largest secular civic event in the world. And of course, it involves multi-generational collaborations. And if you are trying to find an Earth Day event in your neighborhood, you can go to earthday.org. They actually have an event locator. And if you're organizing one in your neighborhood, you can actually register there so more people can find you and participate in your event. Next slide. So Earth Day, One Green Thing, and our whole approach at One Green Thing are really all about driving culture change. And we saw that Earth Day did drive culture change that allowed these huge federal laws to not only get passed, but be implemented in a way that they're still implemented. And of course, there's lots of threats to them right now, but they really have changed the quality of our life in significant ways. But how can you help ignite culture change? The first is to engage in a daily practice of sustainability based on your service superpower. The most important thing is that you don't have to do everything. If you know rallies aren't your thing, you can still be part of the climate movement. Maybe you're really into kind of sharing trends or sustainable brands and trying them out and sharing them with your friends. That counts. Maybe you like going to lectures and bringing a friend. That counts. Maybe you don't even consider yourself an environmentalist, but you are worried about how young people are feeling about the future and you wanna get involved and write a check for groups that are organizing, that also counts. You need to find out where your comfort zone is, where your talents are. We might wanna push you a little bit out of your comfort zone, but understand that you don't have to have a PhD to be part of this movement. Everyone is welcome, everyone is needed. A second thing you can do is listen to young people about how they feel about the climate crisis. Now, I've had many friends say to me, you know, Heather, of course, your kids have eco anxiety because they're your kids. <laughs> you know, you're an environmentalist. But when I say to them, ask the young people you love how they feel about the future, how they feel about climate. To a person, it has been a game changing conversation when the adults hear the worry and the stress and the fear that young people have. The third is to talk about climate change, especially solutions. Don't spend too much time worrying about the deniers, but let's talk about the solutions because the fact is there's huge support for clean energy, huge support. We've seen that with the passage. just probably the next nine months as more and more of these federal dollars and federal investments in clean energy happen. But talk about climate change, talk about how you feel, talk about solutions, and keep that top of mind. Bring climate action to your work, all kinds of wonderful opportunities for you to engage with your green initiatives at work, talk about your carbon footprint as a team, but also provide opportunities for people to take civic action. And then five, and this is a fun resource that we have at One Green Thing, it's, it's a pledge. And it's a pledge to start thinking like ancestors. We need to start embracing long-term thinking and thinking about 
the future that we are leaving our loved ones, the loved ones that we haven't even met yet, but they will be part of their li our lives. What legacy are we going to be leaving them? Next slide, please. So now let's talk about Earth Day in the future. And we have a great uh, resource at onegreenthing.org, and I'll put this in the, the notes um, of the YouTube, is that we have a visualization exercise where you think about 2030 and you visualize what life could be like if we actually do it right. And in the environmental movement, we talk a lot about the pain and suffering that people are already experiencing because of the extreme weather events caused by the climate crisis. But I think we could do a better job talking about the hopeful vision of the future, the regenerative future that we can create. And these are two really cool pictures of an architect based in Paris, Vincent Calbo. And I encourage you to take a look and think about the concept of what's called solar punk, P-U-N-K, solar punk. But it's just this idea of making sure we lean into this vision of a beautiful future where green design is centered, where equity are centered in climate solutions, and where compassion is centered too. So there's an opportunity for us to create an experience where we might even be able to say, we did it. We did limit, um, we did limit ourselves to 1.5 degrees. Next slide, please. What now? Please engage in a daily practice of sustainability, your One Green Thing. Share if you can on social or work at One Green Thing. Take the awesome ancestor pledge. I also have a TED Talk, which kind of goes through our whole philosophy and process at One Green Thing. And please join our community. Next slide. Our next workshop is actually Thursday, May 11th. It's called Love Your Mother Earth. It's all about the importance of connecting to the outdoors and promoting overall well-being. Next slide. Please follow and share and join our community. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And we're so thankful that you joined us today. Thank you.